Um, and if we'd have got things right back in November, she could have been. That's I'll, I'll just leave. <laughs> I, I'm just going to leave it right there, okay, because I want more than one night to be able to speak to you. But those things happen. That, that's just part of ministry. If you've been ministering any time, that kind of stuff happens a lot, more so than you think. And uh, But she sends greetings and her love. She loves this house. My family loves this house. And uh, I would ask you to pray for my son, Tyler, and his wife, Jimmy, and my two granddaughters, Bella and Heidi. They are in Africa on a mission trip. And uh, they will be there through the first part of next week and then Head back into Texas. They pastor a church there, started a church a few years ago, and God is blessing their church. But pray for them. And um, this may be a little bit different, but but I talked to a pastor, for, a preacher friend of mine today, and uh, really going through a hard time in his family. And he asked me. He said, "Brother David, please tell the he don't know you. You don't know him. But but for some reason, he said to me, Pastor Stephen, tell those people to pray for my family." So I told him, I said, if God gives me the opportunity and there's not a different type of leading in the service, I sure will ask. And I know that you will pray. I know that. So uh, I, first of all, I want you to put your hands together. Let's honor the great pastors, the great authority of this house. 30 years. Just celebrated 30 years. That's incredible. That is incredible. And... Uh, Pastor Appreciation Month hasn't been that long ago. I'm old enough to remember it was Pastor Appreciation Day. You just got a day. You didn't get, you didn't get a month. You didn't get a week. You didn't get five days. You got one day. It was Pastor Appreciation Day. Now you get a whole month to have cakes and pies and, and, and cards and, and checks and hallelujahs. That's right. <laughs> but uh, I'm waiting for Evangelist Appreciation Month. Just haven't found that on the calendar yet, and I'm not sure it's going to be there. (laughs) But I love you guys. I mean that with everything that's in me, Pastor. I love you. I trust you. You're a man of integrity, and um, we can talk about stuff you couldn't talk about with everybody. And that's the truth. That's a valuable thing if you're a minister. So I appreciate that. And all the staff got to have lunch with uh, Brother Paul and Brother Austin today and just had a great time with them and just love you, all all of you so very much. Thank you for your giving. May God bless you for that. Now listen, I've been been kind of bullied today to not preach a long time. I won't tell you what all the avenues that came through, but I just kind of feel like I've been bullied today, okay? And it wasn't cyber bullying. It was in your face bullying. (laughs) So so, so here's what I was taught. The only way to deal with bullies is to stand up to it. So I'm just going to preach two hours, and I'm going to defeat the bully tonight, okay? (laughs) Uh, That's great. That's great. Good to see Brother Jason and Sister Ruthie tonight. Love you guys. Wonderful to see you. I mean that. I don't get to see these folks very much. And uh, Ruthie, I love that name. Uh, I'm kind of hoping Jason will switch his name to Boazzy. That just kind of goes together, doesn't it, brother? Ruthie and Boazzi. <laughs> Come on, laugh a little. Humor me, okay? I, I drove a long way to be with you. Laugh at my jokes. Say amen to my preaching. Just do whatever you got to do to encourage me, okay? Let's stand together tonight back real quick again. We're going to go in the scriptures to the book of 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings 7. You've heard a thousand messages from this text, I'm sure. This will be a thousand and one. Second Kings 7. I don't, I don't know why it's been happening like this to me as of late. Because normally if I get on a trail in the morning, um, for years, if I got on that trail, it just stayed on that trail, that train of thought all day long. But it seems like over the last several months, and it's kind of, uh, disturbing in a way, but I'm not my own. I belong to the Lord. And I, I really got into something this morning that was stirring me very, very deeply that I thought I would be bringing to the pulpit tonight to, to speak to you. But we, we got to lunch, and I've, I've got to where I take an old man nap now. I'm not that old, but, but I'm just trying to 
to develop that ability to take an old man nap, which means probably about 20 minutes of snoring and you're done. That's basically what that amounts to. But when I got up, I, I, I really believe I heard these words in my spirit. And, and some of you would not be prepared probably to hear this because it may not apply to you. But I believe the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, David, there's going to be people that you're going to speak to tonight that really feel like giving up. Now, that's almost absurd to say that in an atmosphere like this. How could anybody be in an atmosphere like this and feel like giving up? The same way that Peter quit walking on the water. The same way that Satan had iniquity. Lucifer had iniquity in his heart and he fell. The same way that Judas could be in the presence of the Lord and still be Satan possessed. Same way. Same way. And I just know in my spirit tonight, and this, this is a, a, a word that came to, together very quickly. It's not going to be deep. It's not going to be something you're probably going to talk about for days but I do believe it's a rhema word. It's a now word. So if this doesn't apply to you, if you're, if you're together, you've got it together, let it be preparatory because there may be a day in your life in the future where something is so traumatic in your own life that you wonder, can I go on? And, and even beyond that, do I want to go on? And a lot of people even get there. I've been there before. Do I even want to go on? I'm not talking about giving up on God. I'm just talking about giving up on the pursuit of purpose in Christ and the will of God. So that being said, let's read 2 Kings 7, beginning in verse number 3. We're going to read down through verse number 7. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. Now you're in bad shape when your only option is to go to the enemy. It's really a tough spot to be in. Unless, unless there is something in your heart that's yielding beyond where you are and what you see. Come, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight. Everybody say the twilight. Say it again, the twilight. To go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come, come upon us. Wherefore, they arose and fled in the twilight. Everybody say the twilight. Listen, that, that's not the vampire stuff. Okay? This is incredible. They're moving at twilight. They're giving up their position at twilight and the enemy is giving up their position at twilight. One good move leads to another. How many of you heard what I just said? One good move leads to another. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. I want to preach tonight with the help of the Holy Ghost, twilight give-ups. Twilight give-ups. Father, bless your people to hear the word. Bless me to speak. Father, we're here for your glory. Let there be fruit that you may be glorified. Let the fruit that manifests tonight, let it remain. But let it bring forth honor and glory to the Father. Let it validate the great suffering of Christ. <clears throat> let your covenant manifest. Let your kingdom come. 
Let your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let us feast on daily bread, O God. Cleanse us of sins. God, help us to forgive those that have sinned against us. God, I thank you that you're not gonna lead us into temptation, but you're going to deliver us from evil and the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, everybody shouted amen. You can be seated tonight. God bless you for reverencing the word. Twilight give-ups. Here's what the Lord alerted me to this afternoon. And I, he said this to me. He said, there are people among us tonight whose next move will determine everything about the next phase of your life. Now, I could stop right there and give an altar call because there's a whole lot in that statement. People among us tonight whose next move will determine everything, not some things, but everything about the next phase of your life. Right now, some of you feel like you're on the verge of extinction more than being on the verge of expansion. But that contrast is very real. But I know by the Spirit, you're not on the verge of extinction, you're on the verge of expansion. Some of you can't fathom right now that there is a move available to you that will not only overthrow your enemy but will also overflow your supply capacity and that's going to happen simultaneously. Think about what I just said to you. God will overthrow your enemy and overflow your capacity to receive substance all in one move. I know it's early, but I got to do this. I know it's early. Wow. But both of these can and will occur if you make the correct move. All of that plausibility is contained in you making the correct move in your life right now. Now, that seems almost impossible because of where and how the enemy has positioned himself in your life. Because when you see the position and the whereabouts of the enemy, it seems like right now where he is and what he has done has taken a very severe toll on your life. He seems very entrenched. He seems immovable. And here's what's happened. Because of where the enemy is and because of how he's operating in your life, some of you have not experienced real viable intake of the spirit in a long time. You sit in a church where there is great preaching and great singing every service. I mean, there's not an off night here. I, I don't see how there could be. And yet you can sit here with where the enemy is operating in your life and how he's operating in your life and all that stuff is coming at you from every angle but some of you yet have not taken that into your spirit. You felt it in your emotions but you didn't take it into your spirit. But even beyond that, you not taking something into your spirit, there has also not been outflow from you. It's been some time since you've ministered to the Lord like you need to. It's been some time since you've ministered to others like you need to. Oh, you've told them how you felt when they ask you. (laughs) And 30 minutes later, they're glad to get on to somebody else. Some people, you don't ask them how they're doing. They will tell you. They'll tell you every vitamin and every medication they're taking to get over that. (laughs) They'll give you their doctor's name and his phone number. So there's, there, there's been no new intake and there's been no outflow. You are under siege. I just described to you, you are under siege just like Samaria was. Nothing could come into them. Nothing could get out beyond them. And they were weakening by the day. 
Every day, every moment, every week, every month that went by, it was getting worse and worse and worse. And I'm describing people tonight that because this is the reality in your life, you are ready to give up. And it's been your inactivity and it's been your non-decisiveness that has prolonged your agony. It's because you haven't moved, it's why it's still like it is. You're in twilight. When you're in twilight, that means you have one foot in the night and one foot in your new day. How many of you heard what I just said? When you're in twilight, you've got one foot in in the night and you've got one foot in your new day. Your one foot is firmly on the grounds of your night. One foot is searching for the footing of a new day, yet you have never been more ready to just give it all up than you are right now. And you're one move away from your life changing forever. Pastor quoted a verse today. That's a very powerful verse. And I try to live by this verse. The Bible talks about how you don't boast yourself of tomorrow. You don't know what a day is going to bring forth. It was in the context of that young lady being killed in the automobile accident. You don't know when you get in that vehicle if you're going to make it home or make it to your destination except for the grace of God. But I will tell you this. In this service tonight, God is going to place a tomorrow over your life. And when God says there's going to be a tomorrow, you can boast in that tomorrow. Hallelujah. I said when God says there's a new day coming for you, you can take that to the bank and you you can begin to magnify and worship God for that reality. Listen to what the Bible says. 2 Kings chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 17. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow. Tomorrow, you're getting out of the twilight, he's saying. There's gonna be a tomorrow. About this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? He said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. And I want to throw in verse 17 to show you where, where this man had jurisdiction. The king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have the charge of the gate, and the people trod upon him in the gate. So, so listen, Elisha appears to speak this prophetic tomorrow in the vicinity of the gate of the city of Samaria. He's speaking it there. That's the jurisdiction of this man. And Elisha's there. Now, what's crazy about that is that was also the position of the lepers. They are at the entering in of the gate. I can't prove it by the Bible. I'm not trying to put something in a place where the Bible doesn't say anything about it. But I'm just supposing tonight that it's possible that these lepers could have heard Elisha speaking that word tomorrow. Now what Elisha doesn't say, he didn't say that the Lord is gonna work this incredible miracle in the camp of the Syrians to bring about provision that's gonna bust that famine and alleviate it altogether. He just said the Lord says tomorrow, tomorrow something's gonna be different in this city. If they did hear it, and again, I'm not saying they did, but if they did hear the word that Elisha was speaking, they must have misinterpreted interpreted it because they thought perhaps that the enemy's coming in. What he's saying is that the the siege is going to be over and the enemy's going to make a move to come into this city and take it over and put egregious prices on our goods and tax the people beyond their ability to accommodate life. That may have been what they heard. That may have been how they interpreted that word if they did hear it. Whatever the case, they came to the conclusion Our survival depends on giving up. We've got to give up to the enemy. There's no reason to stay here. There's no reason to go into the city. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're going to die. There's only one option here, and that's to give up. But what Elisha was telling the people is, the gate of this city has been targeted to be an entry point of good things. Something's going to come through this gate 
tomorrow that's going to change everything around. I just come to this service tonight to tell people in this room right now, your gate has been marked by God. The gate to your life, God is after it tonight. And it's about to open up, not to more of the enemy and not to more bad things, but something great and something powerful and something glorious is going to come through that gate that's going to break your dark night and bring you into the new day. I've come to tell somebody, you will live to fight and to see the glory of God another day. There is a tomorrow for your life. Hallelujah. You know, sometimes God will just put stuff in your spirit. And it's just so matter of fact. Listen, you, you take this for what it's worth. I believe he said this to me. He said, your next move to get into your tomorrow is very simple. Get out of the way. never felt so good to say that. Get out of the way. Because you've got to, if you're going to enter into a new day at some point, you're going to have to put, pull that one foot out of the night and get them both moving into your tomorrow. You're going to have to move. You're going to have to get in action and move with God. So both of your feet have to be moving into the promise of your new day. Here's, here was the sense I got from God. The reason that some things have not changed is because you're in the same position you were a year ago, five months ago, five weeks ago. You're still sitting there. You're in the way of the gate being accessed by that good thing to come into your life. So if God's gonna take over your gate and God's gonna push something wonderful through your gate, to get it into your life, then you're gonna have to get out of the way. God said to me a couple of years ago, he said, David, you are the reason. I've never been able to use you to the degree and capacity that I want to. Listen, it's one thing to fall on the rock and to be broken. But when that rock falls on you and crushes you, it's a different thing altogether. That rock fell on me. You know what God was saying? Get out of the way. You're blocking the gate up, David, and the only way I'm gonna be able to get you into your tomorrow and into your greater, you're gonna have to get out of the way of the gate and start moving into your new day and let the blessing of God that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow begin to manifest in your life. Come on, somebody give God praise in this house. I'll give you a case in point. If I've told this here before, just shout like it's the first time you heard it. In fact, it's been a few years ago now. You know, th th this is really rare for me to preach in a church of this size. It's very rare. I usually preached about 35, 40, 50 people. 70 and 80s big. Anything over 50 is a mega church to me. <laughs> so this is mega on steroids in here. But, but God put in my spirit that I was supposed to go to this church and it was in a large city. They had hundreds of people. I don't, I don't ask people for a date unless they open the door for me to do so. So I knew I was not going to call that pastor. I knew there was no way it was going to happen by me initiating that. But I had a dream one night. and I, I, I was at this church and where I knew I was supposed to preach and, and I'm on the parking lot. Now they call it the campus. Air quote, campus. So, so I'm on the campus. We called it the parking lot back in the day. <laughs> so so I'm, on, I'm on the campus ground of this church and people are funneling me between the buildings. I'm going from one building and out from between one into another, but I'm not getting into the sanctuary and I'm not getting into the pulpit. And the longer my dream lasted, 
the more frustrated I could feel I was getting because I'm not supposed to be out here on the parking lot. I'm supposed to be in the pulpit preaching. Not that I have anything special to give more than anybody else. I just knew I was supposed to be there. So when I woke up, that frustration was real. I could feel it, so I knew it was God. I knew it was God. So now what's going through my mind, why, why, why couldn't I get in the church there? Why was, what was I doing on the campus facility, but I wasn't in the building. I wasn't in the sanctuary behind the pulpit. So I didn't think a whole lot about it beyond that. But a few days later, I had another dream, and I'm back on the campus. This time... I'm going in the buildings. I'm in buildings and people are funneling me down through hallways and I'm going in rooms and out of rooms. Finally, I get in the sanctuary and, and just about like this, Pastor Stephen, I, I was like this. I'm, I'm over here. I'm in a chair. The pastor's up at the pulpit. I'm on the edge of my seat because I know now what I feel like I'm supposed to do. He's about to introduce me. I'm about to get to the pulpit and I'm about to fulfill something I know God has for my life, but he never called me up there. And I woke up again, and I, I could feel frustration in the dream. When I woke up, it was very real. So I, I thought, God, what, what's, what are you saying to me here? Why couldn't I get up there? And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, David, you're the reason you're not there. It's not because the pastor didn't call you. But you're going to have to make some adjustments in your life. It wasn't egregious things. It wasn't, it wasn't some life-altering thing. It wasn't starting to do something. It wasn't necessarily stopping something I was doing. You're just gonna have to make some adjustments. You're gonna have to consecrate to a different dimension for me to get you into that pulpit. In other words, if God's gonna have some ministry to come through that gate to me and for me, then I'm gonna have to get out of the way. So I had to get up and move. I had to do something different. Come on, I'm talking to somebody tonight. It's not up to God anymore if it's gonna happen. He's decreeing over your life tonight. There is a tomorrow for you. There is blessing for you. There is victory for you. But he's gonna move when you get out of the way. So you understand, being in the way and sitting with a debilitating disease at the gate is a position of weakness and vulnerability. You gotta hear what I'm about to tell you. You don't have to be well to move. Oh, hallelujah. Come on now, you missed a good chance to shout right there. You don't have to be well to move. They're still leprous men when they started moving. Everything don't have to be in order in your life. You just got to accommodate what's God doing. Everything will line up as you move. Come on, somebody. God's trying to help you tonight. Stop thinking, I've got to do this and I've got to be this. No, you don't have to be well to get up and move. You've just got to move. Brother David, if I just knew what was out there, I just knew what it'd be like, what I was moving into. I believe I could really do it. Listen, God wants you to know tonight, you don't have to know every detail of your next move to move. Boy, I'm helping me if I'm not helping anybody else. I keep on preaching like this, I'm gonna have to give him my own offering. Listen to this statement. Sometimes the faith to move yourself is more powerful than faith to move a mountain. Woo. Sometimes faith to move yourself is more powerful than faith to move a mountain. What the lepers didn't know is that their stepping away from the gate released the tread of God into the enemy's camp. There's a whole lot tied up in your move. 
God's willing to move, told you he's going to move, but you're going to have to move to release the move. When they got up and left the gate and started moving out, left the twilight, moving toward their new day, then that released the tread of God into the enemy's camp. Now, I love what we're about to get into here. Let's go to 2 Kings 6. and Look at verses 14 through 17 with me. They took, therefore, two chariot horses and the king. I'm sorry, it's it's chapter 6, brothers. I put 7. I apologize. It's chapter 6, 2 Kings 6. Here, I'll just read it right here. Verses 14 through 17. It says, that They took, therefore, two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. And they went after them. That's that's 7, too. I'm in 7. Let me get to 6. I'll get it right in a minute. I needed 10 more minutes in that old man nap. Therefore sent he there the horses. Here we go. And chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. When the servant of the man of God was risen early, gone forth, behold, and hosts compassed the city, both with horses and chariots, and his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. You got to hear what we're about to move into. There is another realm that exists beyond this one. In fact, there are realms, plural, that exist beyond this one. Here's what the Bible would call the realm I'm talking about. It calls it the third heaven. Paul was called up into the third heaven. The Bible would call it the heaven of heavens. The Bible would call it our Father which art in heaven. The Bible would call it Jesus looked up to heaven. That's where he's looking. He's looking into this realm that I'm talking about because that's where the Father's activity is. That's where everything he wants to do has already been decided upon. That's where his will is administrated from. That's where decisions in your life, that's where covenant issues have already been settled because of the judgments of God. So that realm exists. That realm is higher and superior to the second heaven where the enemy is and lower. It's superior to that. So it doesn't matter what's happening in the realm where Satan and demons are and those that are loosed on the earth right now. It really doesn't matter what they are doing in juxtaposition to what's happening in this other realm. Now here's what I want you to know tonight. You're not just to know that this other realm exists. That doesn't help you. Just to know that it's there. It's not enough just to know that there is a third heaven where God has already answered every question and gave a solution to every problem in your life. But what we are to see in that realm is that everything that is there is for us in every way. That's what you have to know. Not only is it for you, it is available to you. So you've got to know that. It's not enough to know that it's there. You have to know that everything there is for you. There is more for you in that realm than there is against you in the second heaven and below. Hear this now. These forces of God are subject to timing issues and the church's participation and obedience in the Lord's prescribed times and seasons. I want to say that again. These forces of God are subject to timing issues and the church's participation and obedience in the Lord's prescribed times and seasons. Now look at Romans chapter 8, verses 27 through 31. He that searcheth the hearts, that's Christ, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, once you know that what's in that other realm is for you and not against you, it really doesn't matter when you wake up in the morning like Elisha's servant did and look around and there's a stirring of horses and chariots and the clanging of the swords of the Syrian warriors. It doesn't matter how many are out there. They can be out there more than the multitude of grasshoppers. But you've got to know, no matter how much is against you in that lower realm, there's always more for you in the heavenly realm and listen it didn't come just to show you that it's up there and is available it's there so it can manifest and get into your situations hear me tonight part of the spirit's intercession for us picture Elisha laying hands on that young man Lord open his eyes let him see into that realm part of the spirit's intercession for us is convincing us praying for us that our eyes the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened that we may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the glory of the riches of his inheritance in the saints of God. See, this is what the Spirit prays for. Lord, open the eyes of Owens. Open the eyes of Calvary Temple. Let them know that that realm's available. Let them know that that realm is active. Let them know that that realm is ready to invade earth. Satabaka, ratabaka, siondaba, ready to heal their body, ready to meet their need, ready to help their finances, put their family together. Come on, somebody. I said, we can know the God is for us reality. There's more for us reality when our eyes are open to see that realm is available to us. Come on, lift your hands up and give God a shout of praise in this house. Hallelujah. So do you see the Spirit's intercession now for this? Because that more for us stuff is what makes everything good. Let's go on. 2 Kings 6, verses 18 through 23. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord. When the Syrians started moving in for the attack, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And God smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them, catch this now, he led them to, to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. You get around Elisha, you're going to have an eye-opening experience. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, my father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? You ready to turn, ready for me to turn my henchmen loose, my highest military men loose on these enemies of God? And Elisha answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. He prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. Now you think about what we just read there as well. The enemy is easy pickings. I mean, he could have left them blind and took every one of them out with no problem at all. But he didn't do that. He let them live. There was no aggressive action taken against the Syrian forces. 
by Elisha nor by the military personnel of Israel. Instead, he prayed that they could be healed and they were healed and then he started feeding them. Started having all day dinner and singing on the ground. (laughs) That's what I like. You heard me right, all day dinner and singing on the ground. (laughs) Now they're eating. They're being strengthened. They just came through a very confusing time. Blind one moment, now they can see, but now they're being fed. And strength is coming back and clarity is coming back. Elisha provides great provision for them. And now they're looking around because they're in Samaria now. Remember that. They are in Samaria. They're looking around and saying, man, look at all the great provision in this city. What could that do for the Syrians? What could this city do for us? So immediately it started coming into their psyche. We need this city. We can take this city. There's no aggression to this city. They're not going to fight against us. If they were going to take us out, they would have taken us out right now. But now they see Samaria as the next big target. So here's the question. Why would Elisha not release the fury of God upon them? You ever wonder that? God, why didn't you handle it back here? When it seemed easier to take care of my situation, why didn't you let it be settled right here? Why did you seem to let it strengthen? Why did you let it survive? Not only did you let it survive, God, but you let it come back with more strength and a greater fury and a greater spirit of murder and mayhem in my own life. Why didn't God take them out then? Because it wasn't the time and it wasn't the place. Now they set up this siege against Samaria. They come back later on and they set up a siege against Samaria. They want that city. They just got fed and watered in in Samaria. They were allowed to live in Samaria and now they're ready to take the city over. Why didn't God take it back there? It wasn't the time and the place and the king became so infuriated against Elisha, he wanted to kill Elisha. Elisha, this is your fault. We had them dead to rights. We could have taken them out, but you let them live. And now look what's happening, Elijah. You even fed and watered them. How many of you know the best way to break something is to sow something opposite of it? If you're in a famine, the best way to break it is to give some bread and water to your enemy. But that's not my message. This king wanted to take Elijah out. Hear this now. This type of offense can disqualify you from miracles. You'd be amazed at how many people are offended at God right now because he didn't do it like you wanted him to do it. It didn't work out the way you should have worked out in your mindset. There was a better time, a better framework for it to work out in, but instead, not only did it survive, it came back stronger, and now you're in a more difficult situation than you've ever been in before, and you're angry at God, and you're angry at Christ, and you're angry at the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to get over that offense. You have to get over it. Blessed is he who's not offended in Christ. Jesus said that. You can't, have the, you can't carry that type of offense around toward God. God chose to let them come back with a vengeance because he knew when they came back, they're going to come back and set up camps. It's going to be so full of abundance. It's going to be more than enough not only to break the famine, but to set every store back up with goods and services and the people can come in and buy food for their families. Yes, the army was against Israel, but the supply of the army was for Israel. Hallelujah. There's always more for you than there is against you. Come on, somebody. Somebody hear what the Holy Ghost is saying tonight. There's always more for you than there is against you. God just setting you up for something greater. That's why it didn't happen back there. Ooh. The miracle started at twilight and in between time of the day. 
and in between season. Be instant in season and out of season, which means be instant in between. This is an in-between time of day. It's not fully night. It's not fully day. The lepers give up. They leave out from the gate at twilight. The host of the Syrians arose and fled in the twilight. The movement of the lepers released the in-between to become the prophetic tomorrow. It led to the discovery of good things that would end the famine. Let's go to 2 Kings 7, 26, rather. We're getting close to the end here. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians. You got four leprous men, who knows, they may have been shuffling because of their disease. He made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Now you see why Elisha wanted his servant to know that there's another realm available. Now he realizes they are not there where they are on the mountains surrounding Samaria just to look pretty just to give some good preaching material to Pentecostal preachers about how there's more for you than there is against you. Now we see why they are positioned where they are around Samaria as they were. They were not there for looks. They were not there for leverage. They were there for war and they were there for victory. I submit to you that what Elisha saw on that mountain and his servants saw on that mountain when the lepers started moving out, they came off that mountain. They They came out of that realm and they started marching around in the camp of the Syrians and the Syrians said, we got to get out of here because there's more against us than there is for us right now. I'm here to tell you, if you'll move tonight, if you'll get up from where you are and you'll go to the throne of God, it's going to release you tomorrow. Heaven's going to invade the earth. Hallelujah. Come on, everybody stand with me tonight. Everybody stand with me. Some of you think, Brother David, I'm I'm, I'm floundering. I'm flailing. I feel like I'm even falling away. In a sense, that's where these guys are floundering. They're, They're flailing away. They're even falling away, it seems, to the enemy. but really they are entering the fresh breeze. You look up that word twilight, what it means is a fresh breeze or the evening breeze that starts to blow. See, when you get up and move in the will of God, the breath of the Spirit accompanies you. It begins to blow begins to move what's in that realm of God begins to manifest into this one and here's what you discover oh hear this tonight dear church moving yourself can be equivalent to moving the mountain 